Hi there and welcome to Power Play, live just outside of the House of Commons. I'm Vashti Capellos here on Parliament Hill, where it was a very significant day for the Prime Minister and his leadership of the Liberal Party. A very significant meeting of Liberal MPs took place earlier today. The meeting lasted three hours. Normally on Wednesdays when Liberals hold caucus, the meeting is just a few hours. A number of MPs, more than two dozen, I'm told, took to the microphone and voiced to the Prime Minister their concerns about his leadership, asking him to step aside as leader of the Liberal Party. Now, the Prime Minister, I'm told at the end of that meeting, did promise Liberal MPs that he would do just that, reflect on his leadership of the party. Here's what he told reporters publicly after leading, leaving the meeting. The Liberal Party is strong and united. Now, one thing is true. The party and its MPs are united, you could say, very much so, in the uh, idea that they want to face off and defeat Pierre Polyev and the federal conservatives. But around the leadership of the prime minister, I think anything could be further from the truth based on what I'm hearing from sources who were inside that room. Again, more than two dozen MPs took to the microphone asking the prime minister to leave. That is all based on a letter that was circulated over the last two weeks that has the endorsement or signature of 24 Liberal MPs. In that letter, there is actually an ultimatum issued for the Prime Minister to make a decision on the leadership, on his leadership of the party by October the 28th, which is just a week away. A number of MPs and ministers took to the microphone, I'm told anywhere close to between 15 and 20, uh, to defend the Prime Minister and his leadership. Many of them took to the microphone, I should say, after those MPs who were dissatisfied with the Prime Minister's leadership. Here's how a lot of them framed the issue emerging from the meeting. It was a, a great discussion, the type of discussion I think Canadians would be proud to see. But one thing that we are united on, everybody is beating Polia. Do you feel like the Prime Minister adequately address some of the concerns that were brought up today? Um, I think somewhat, and I think there's some of what was asked uh, without going into further detail, I think he'll have an opportunity to reflect upon that. I think it was, it was, it was healthy, it was, it was robust, and I, when, at the end of it, I think we were united. I think, I, I'm absolutely certain in my conviction that the Prime Minister, uh, Justin Trudeau, is the right person to lead us. So what exactly happened in that room and what's going to happen over the next few days? Uh, Liberal MP Ken Hardy is my next guest. And Ken Hardy joins me now. Hi, Mr. Hardy. Bassie, good to see you. It's good to see you as well. Thank you very much for making the time. I know you're somewhat limited in what you can say about what transpired inside the room, but can you just sort of, from a 20 foot above perspective, tell me you've been to a lot of different caucus meetings over the last number of years. Where does this one fit in? Well, this is a highlight partially because it uh, represented the way we've approached other issues, very difficult ones. Uh, you know, I, I talk about the uh, war in Gaza. You know, we have a very large uh, Jewish contingent in caucus and a very large Muslim one. You know, and the conversations are difficult but respectful. And we come out of there, you know, I, I think feeling you know, pretty good about where we are as a party. And I think it's the same today. Do you? And, and what gives you that impression today? Because this isn't an issues-based conversation as much as it is central to the leadership of the party. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I think first, of, there's, there's kind of a, a technical thing I guess we have to look at. Um, this wasn't a divisive issue per se. Like, it isn't like the old days of Chrétien versus Martin. Right? There's no, no plan B no. in the works. Well, yeah. No, and, 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 and nor is anybody thinking about that. I think, though, you know, what we recognize is that uh, I mean, I'm the class of 2015, right? That was a change election. I have this pin on and I'm here because uh, Justin Trudeau did what he did very effectively. We could be looking at a change election coming up. The big question is, well, okay, can we be the change? that people will accept. And so that was kind of the um, approach and, and, and the nature of the conversation that we had, you know. Um, what argument can we put forward that would have Canadians say, you know, these birds deserve another chance in government? And what uh, does the Prime Minister do to deal with the same thing that's happened to every other leader of a governing party in my living memory, which is a lot longer than yours, and that is that, you know, shortly after a change election, the, the, the leader's popularity plummets. It happens every time. So, can we um, cheat history on this one? Well, 
Those are some of the questions that we are asking. And, and involved in the discussion about whether or not, as you put it, you can cheat history, what would you tell Canadians watching tonight about people uh, in your caucus who felt that wasn't possible under the current leadership? Did they have the ability to voice those opinions freely in today's caucus? We heard every possible opinion. And what was interesting is it wasn't a binary, you know, he should stay or he should go. There was a lot, of, including my own intervention, uh, where I said, you know, we need to be thinking about this in order to make a decision as to what should actually happen. Uh, and it was surprising the number of different aspects that we can consider when we talk about change, you know, in writ large, right? Um, and what I took out of it, and I think what many people, including the Prime Minister, took out of it is, we have a lot to go away and think about. There's a working through process here. When you think of all of the layers within layers, all of the you know, permutations and combinations of things that need to happen in order for the Liberal Party to be government next time, the key one being that it would be absolutely dreadful if we turned this country over to Pierre Polyev. That was the big unifier. I could tell that from, from everybody emerging. Yeah. They, they definitely pivoted to, the, to that point very, yeah. very easily and very, very much so everyone who did speak. I guess what I, what I wonder is when you talk about the things that need to be reflected on and the time with which you'll do that, I would respectfully ask and challenge, you know, how much time is there? Because the prospect of an election, yes, is, is officially not a year away, but you and I have lived through the last six weeks here. It has subsumed, uh, you know, com all conversation, all the agenda has essentially been, yes, there's a procedural issue, but essentially all we're talking about day in and day out is if your government will survive. Do you really have time on your side to reflect on whether or not Justin Trudeau should lead the party? Oh, I think we do, yes. And how absolutely. much time, in your don't view? Know. I, that, that I don't know. I, I, I think we're good till Christmas for sure, and then, you know, we've got all of January. So, no, there is a fair bit of time available to us. Now, let's face it, there is a clock that is ticking, and at some point, uh, we will will, as a caucus, need to hear answers to a whole bunch of questions that were asked. At the same time, Canadians will need to hear the answer to the big question is why do these guys deserve another term in government? Do you think Canadians should have already been on the receiving end of the answer to that question vis-a-vis -vis the leader of your party? Because, the, and I'll explain to you why I'm asking, you know, a number of MPs whom I've spoken with over the last 10 days who were in a different camp perhaps than yours, who were opposed to the Prime Minister continuing on with his leadership felt as though the case had not been made to Canadians nor to them about why he should remain in power, why the Liberals should remain in power, especially in light of the by-election losses, especially in light of the sustained polling disadvantage against the Tories. Like, they felt that time had already come and gone, and they were frustrated that that message had not yet been delivered to them or Canadians. Do you share in any of that frustration? I share the last part. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, the session we had today should have been held in June after the, uh, the Toronto-St. Paul's uh, by-election. Uh, it didn't. Okay, it is what it is, so we've kind of made up some ground today. Um, but you're right, I mean, Canadians do deserve answers. But we have um, a question that actually, when you get into it, really morphs. I mean, you know, for a long time, especially post-pandemic, we were dealing with some significant uh, you know, social and, and, and fiscal issues in the country. But now we see those things working out, right? Employment is up, interest rates are down, inflation is actually below target. So, okay, now, what does that mean to the proposition that we can offer Canadians? Because my own personal view, and I've expressed this very, very clearly to the leader and to everybody else, is that all of the things we've done as government up to now, over the last nine years, they've been good, but people have probably forgotten about them. The big question is, given the foundation that we've established, what's next? That's the big question that we're waiting to hear, and I think Canadians need to hear. Let me ask you, do you feel that the Prime Minister and the people around him are in agreement that they have to answer that question? And again, I'll tell you why I'm asking, because every time I pose it to somebody in the Cabinet, particularly in light of, for example, what happened in Verdun, the last by-election in Montreal, the answer is we're going to continue doing more of the same. And I take your point about the foundation laid, but I think there are a lot of Canadians who are not, despite those macroeconomic indicators, feeling too good about the economic challenges they face right now in particular, or other challenges as well. And so to keep saying, well, we're going to keep doing all the good things we've already done for you, like, is that the proposition? Or are they understanding of the fact that they may need to put, well, that they do need to put more on the table? Well, 
whoever gave you that answer is certainly, certainly hasn't been listening to caucus because caucus is very, very clear. We do need that answer and we need a damn good one, you know, uh, because let's face it, uh, you know, as much as we've done, as good a shape as Canada is in, especially relative to other countries, we also know that there are people in the country who are not doing well, who need hope, they need something to, to look, look to, that, you know, somebody's got a hand on a tiller that's going to steer the country in the right direction. We think the country has been going in the right direction, but what hasn't happened yet is it hasn't filtered down to street level enough to give people confidence that things are going to be okay. That's the answer that we're looking for. When we talk to the Prime Minister and when we talk to the people behind the Prime Minister to say, what's next? And we need that answer. And so whoever told you it's going to be more of the same, uh, as I say, that's not an acceptable answer to me. When you talk about the robust nature, and many of your colleagues did, of the discussion that, that occurred today, were there dozens of people that took the microphone? It went on for a long time, for about three hours. Was, was, did the Prime Minister address it? What can you share with us in that? Well, uh, it, it started and ended uh, as, a, as a normal caucus session would with comments from the Prime Minister, but uh, we went right to what we call the general list, so we didn't go through mm -hmm. Whip's report and House Leader's report, et cetera, et cetera. I uh, estimate about 50 people stood up and spoke. But what was really, really interesting is, you know, we were all listening really, really intently, and as additional people came up to speak, they would either build on something that had been previously said, or introduce another way of looking at something, another nuance, if you want to put it that way. And we all left there with our heads full of things to think about. So. I know it would be much more comforting to a lot of people to say, okay, this is the resolution, this is what happened. But no, we have to go away and we have to process this. I mean, that's part of change management, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, my advice to the party is we have to employ change management in order to really talk to people about change. How do we get from today to where we need to be to give Canadians the confidence that the Liberal Party and the leader, whoever that leader might be, has got their back, who has got you know, a good grasp of the situation, and most importantly, something that the opposition hasn't offered, and that's the solutions. What, what are we gonna do about it? You just mentioned whoever that leader may be. Is it an open possibility that it is not 100% certain that leader is Justin Trudeau? And, and, and can you, if you don't mind, inform that answer with how, you know, by what happened today? Well, I think you know, the, the consensus uh, that I believe was shared 100% uh, in the room is that we all go away and we all think about what we've heard. And including the, the Prime Minister? Including the Prime Minister, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, and uh, uh, you know, there's, there's no, you know, there's been talk of a deadline, there's no deadline here. What there is, though, obviously, is the clock that is ticking toward another election and answers to questions that have been asked. We need those answers as a caucus and as a country, and that's where, that's where the focus is going to be going So you forward. didn't hear anybody say, this October 28th deadline, you must provide us with an answer by then? Uh, you know, there, there was talk about that in whatever that letter was going yes. around. That I, you know, I, I've seen a piece of paper, but I actually haven't, you know, picked it up and read it. Um, you know, okay, uh, I can put any kind of uh, you know, deadline on anything I want, but at the same time, there was no like process, if you will, that a motion was passed right. or anything like that. So yeah, a lot of things were tossed out there. Everything is on the table, I suppose, if you want to look at it that way. But the real job, we as a caucus right now and as a government, we have to go and do the the thinking and the processing of what we've heard today. It was a really rich environment. The, the, the room was light, you know. We weren't, you know, going at each other with uh, daggers and all that kind of stuff. There was nothing cesarean about <laughs> it. Uh, no, it was, it was a very, very um, constructive and extremely respectful conversation, which is something that we've always expected from caucus and it's always been delivered. I'll leave it on that note. Mr. Hardy, I appreciate you taking the time for this. Thank you so Thank much. You,